when they had announced that they were going to reboot the L word, you had very publicly said, I will write for this show. Did any serious conversations ever happen? Yes, they did. Yeah, they reached out Marja, the showrunner. Marja Lewis Ryan, yeah. Yes. She reached out and said she would love to find an opportunity for me. And I wasn't, for whatever reason, I the writing part didn't work out. You know, putting together a writing room is a, a very specific thing. That, you know, it's, it's about the talents you have in the room and the, the sort of gaps that you're looking to fill. And so she then asked if I wanted to actually be on the show and play myself. And I was just like, no, <laughs> I don't want to ever be on television. But I love the L word and it was such an awesome opportunity. And I had a great experience on the show. It was just so wonderful. Yeah, I mean, you were a, a guest of Alice. You were a guest on Alice's talk show. I was. I was indeed. The set was beautiful. Like, you know, the thing about TV is that, you know, when they build a really good set, it's it feels like you're actually, you know, I felt like I was on the set of a talk show. There's been so much criticism of the Elder Generation Q. And if you were in the writer's room, like what's a storyline that or a character that you would have been most drawn toward writing for you know I actually would have loved to see Shane stay with her wife and make a go of having a family because in the original version Shane did a really wonderful job in terms of raising her brother for a little while and she seemed really invested in in parenthood and it and you know parenthood in in a queer way not your typical parenthood which i thought was incredibly important to see you know not everyone wants to be a parent not everyone should be a parent but i think shane in particular has a lot of parental instincts and that they would have been interesting to see what's your take on the the generation q i think it's good i enjoy it very much you know, I think what we're seeing with a lot of these shows that are rebooting is that they're trying to serve as correctives to some real problems that existed in the originals, particularly around representation. And we're seeing that with the L word. And so in some ways, it feels a little forced, the representation that they're doing. And like, they're just trying a little too hard. And so I think they could work on that to make those storylines because they should be there, but they should feel more organic. And so how do you get them to feel more organic? The thing, I also find that they were like all over the place in terms of moving between storylines on the new show. And some of the decisions I just found bewildering, but that's okay. Like you want to ha watch television that makes you think. Mm -hmm. And so... What, do you think that they're going to have Bet and Tina get back together in the end? I fucking hope not. <laughs> I mean, like those two fucking lesbians have been down this road. We know that they are not meant to be together. They actually spend more time apart or in drama than they have ever spent happy. And it's just insanity that they keep trying to like beat this dead horse. It's enough. Yeah. Well, listen, they're filming. They're currently filming the third season, so. I know. We'll and say. I'm really glad I want them to be filming the third season. Yeah. Now, okay, super relevant to you. So I just finished binging and loving The Queer as Folk. It's not, I, I know I wouldn't necessarily call it a reboot. It's really like a reimagining. Yes. And cut to, I see on the credits, written by Roxanne Gay. Now, you wrote an episode of the show. Not only did you write an episode of the show, there's something very specific in this episode that I found personally hilarious. A plot point that r continues to run through the entire episode that you wrote is the Dorinda Medley, she startin' meme. And I want to know, <laughs> my number one question for Roxanne Gay is, was that your idea? No, it was not. I wish I could take credit for it, but it was not my idea. Um, what do we that, know about this? Like, who came up with that? I actually don't know, because we wrote the show before it went into production. And so that happened in production. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, wow. I'm, I, if I had to guess who did it, I would guess that it was probably Ryan O'Connell. 
yeah. who has a really good pop culture sensibility and was with the show after it moved into production because he's also starring in the show. And I sort of shared my ideas and vision for what I would want to do with a remake of Queer as Folk because I had I have actually watched the original. And which characters did you see yourself in or which characters did you feel the most drawn to as a viewer back in the day? In the L word? I loved Shane and Bet. I think those two characters are outstanding and sexy and flawed and interesting. And so I was very drawn to those two characters. And what Oh, and also uh, Carmen. Mm-hmm. Like, Carmen was a badass and Shane should have never fucked that up. <laughs> Just saying. And what about Queer as Folk? Uh, Queer as Folk, uh, I loved Brian and Justin. I thought that was a great relationship and the way it evolved over the course of five seasons, I think it was five, was really compelling. And um, I couldn't stand Michael. Ugh, what a terrible character. Tell me why. Michael's an annoying little bitch, okay? Mm. All he does is whine all the time and judge, judge, judge. It's like, we get it, Michael. You hate everything. Ugh. I just don't I loved, him. I actually really love, I, I mean, Brian Kinney is like, my one true love but also I really loved Michael's partner Ben and how they dealt with the HIV storyline and I was I I found it really interesting that how they brought that back now I mean spoilers but like how they brought that back into the revival show in general is way more complex than the original I know and I, 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 you know, I think the show is actually, and I'm not saying this because I worked on it, you know, <laughs> um, I really think the show is great. I hope it gets renewed for a second season. Uh, I thought that the twist ending at the end of the first season was really remarkable. And mm-hmm. I, you know, I think even though I knew where it was going, even I was surprised and that's awesome to like be surprised by a thing you know is going to happen. You you had said we will have achieved success in terms of, of representation when marginalized creators are allowed to create niche products beyond like the one specific story. Like when one specific story doesn't have to appeal to everyone or just be the one. Yes. Do you do you think we're getting closer to that with things like Fire Island? Like that is a very that the movie Fire Island that. Yeah is such a specific story and it doesn't matter that maybe it it doesn't have like total mass appeal maybe it is just appealing to a certain segment of the population do you think that we're getting closer yeah we're definitely getting closer and fire island is a great example i loved it i thought fire island was just so fun and sexy and interesting and of course there were things I would do differently I would I just think more of the story should have been flushed out Mm -hmm. um it just felt like they were all over the place but still too too many characters I loved it but there were too many there were a lot of characters it was like come on um and (laughs) Margaret Cho for Christ's sake like give her something to do she's actually not actually she's incredibly talented and she is capable of being more than a frumpy lesbian who has no personality other than dead mother. This is, this is totally random, but I actually was on fire Island this weekend and I ran (laughs) and and I ran into, have you, I don't know if you've been to fire Island ever. Not yet. Not yet. You should, you should go have the, have the cherry grove experience. I was literally with a bunch of friends and I ran into Wanda Sykes. I like danced with Wanda Sykes on the dance floor of the ice palace, like mere days ago. Wow. Wow, I'm not right? surprised. You know, I she, love hearing that. She, That's you know, she, amazing. She met my favorite story to tell about Fire Island is that she met her wife on the ferry to the Cherry Grove. Oh my god, that's so romantic. <laughs> that's great. Can I you had believe no that? Idea. Yeah, I, I mean, I can. <laughs> um, now, one of my favorite things about you is the fact that you were married to Debbie Millman, who. I have been a fan of her pod, like, but by, you know, my background is actually in design. I'm a user experience strategist and design strategist. And so I've been listening to Design Matters 
forever. She is one of the original podcasters. She out, really is out there. How did you guys like? How did you even meet her? Uh, she chased me. Actually, um, she chased me for a couple of years trying to get me on her podcast. Okay, and uh, I didn't really. I mean, at first she was trying to get me on my podcast, but she was intrigued and sort of attracted to me through my work. And she kept, um, then she sent this beautiful letter after I sort of, it's a long story, but I blew her off about the podcast because I was just tired of being interviewed. And then she sent me this beautiful email about how moved she was by hunger, which I did Mm -hmm. not respond to. And then she did an event with a mutual friend in New York and Afterwards, they were all hanging out at her house, which is now our house, Mm -hmm. and they were sitting outside in our backyard. And um, my friend mentioned that I'm her mentor. And Debbie said, like, Roxanne Gay, you know, I have a crush on her. I have a huge crush on her. And but I know she has a person because I was in a relationship at the time, though I was and, you know, at the time allowed to see other people. So she was like, you know, what's going on there? And so my friend was like, well, you know, I think you should shoot your shot. And so she wrote me um, after the evening ended and asked if she could take me out on a proper date. And after some hijinks, we actually did go out on a date and we've been together ever since. Why did you ignore that first email that she sent? Um, Because I get tons of requests to be on podcasts. No, 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 not the the pocket. The one where she wrote you how much hunger meant to her. Yeah, I didn't, I actually normally respond to every email. I truly don't know why I did not respond, but I did save it. And so I was able to go back. Um, It is rare that I don't respond to that kind of email. I respond to almost every fan email and I do my own email because I think if someone's going to take the time to reach out to me to talk about my work uh, in a way that's generous and kind the least I can do is respond so I actually don't know what happened there it's just so odd and so how many years have you been together now it'll be four years in October okay wow and what propelled you to get married like why the decision to get married over just being together I think that we wanted to solidify the commitment and you know I actually didn't think she would say yes when I proposed Mm. that um, because she had been married twice before to men, which she says doesn't count. And I would tend to agree. And early on in our relationship, she told me that she's never getting married again. And I believe people. And so when I decided to propose, I I was comfortable with her saying no, because, you know, marriage isn't for everyone. And if you've been burned before, it makes perfect sense that you might not want to go down that road again. But I still thought I would ask because I just, you know, I thought that this is someone I want to spend the rest of my life with and I want to make it official. And so we did. You said the funniest thing, how you identify as bisexual and that's really hard for you because you can't stand men. I mean, there are a lot. There are a lot. I mean, I know, you know, and the thing is, I actually know many, many wonderful men. I know more wonderful men than not, uh, which I'm grateful for. And... At the same time, when you look at men collectively, mm, there's a lot of work to be done there. And so, you know, when you like feel attraction toward a man, it's like, ugh, you're not even worthy. How dare you? Ugh. And but at this point in my life, I'm like literally bisexual for like three men, The Rock, Channing Tatum and <laughs> um, like some other incredibly hot, perfect, perfect man. Your relationship history, like, did you ever, like, come out, like, when you were young, like, growing up in Nebraska? Like, what was the high school, college experience? Like, did you actually properly come out to friends? Um, I came out when I was 19 years old in college. Um, I went to boarding school, and I was for, I mean, I knew I liked women, but I was mostly involved with men throughout high school. And, uh, you know, when I came out at 19, it was very complicated. There were a lot of reasons I came out. Mostly I was just trying to, like, put a wall up between me and my parents, and I thought that would get the job done, (laughs) which is kind of insane. But I just knew, like, I think this might be who I am in part, at least. And so when I came out, I came out as a lesbian. And then it wasn't until years later when I got involved with a man that I 
sort of acknowledge that I'm bisexual and that's fine. I think bisexuality is great. Did they judge you in any way? Like what was the response from your lesbian friends? It was fine, actually. I did not encounter a lot of friction because, I mean, I had been incredibly sort of down for the community and that never changed. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when people like are bisexual and they get involved in a heterosexual relationship, they kind of forget their queerness or set it aside. And there are a lot of reasons why that can happen, but that was never me. Like, I never changed my queerness and I didn't you know I think I only I had only two serious relationships with men and mostly dated women and so it was really never an issue totally switching gears here you have a master class um that's out that's out there how walk me like tell walk me through this like how are you approached did you want to do a master class and also if i can get like the behind the scenes like where do they even film it like how do they film them yeah i maybe three years ago i tweeted i would love to have a master class and then i just moved on like i tweet lots of things and a few cut two or three years like two or three years later master class uh, and a great woman named aaron sermaeus who i think is the head of talent at Masterclass reached out to me to start a conversation. And we started talking about what I would want to do in a Masterclass. And then I worked with them to develop the class. We ended up filming it in Iceland because it was filmed during COVID. They flew my wife and I to Iceland. We quarantined for five days and then we filmed in Reykjavik and got to do some sightseeing. It was my first time there. It was amazing. And they're just incredible to work with. They're the first, it was, like working with them was the first time I felt truly appreciated in my professional life. How so? They treated me like I mattered. They did, they took me seriously. It, it was just such an incredible experience. And, you know, the reality is that, you know, when you are a fat black queer woman, I mean, I have mostly good experiences professionally but people tend to take me for granted and to underestimate me and to their at their own peril and that never happened with masterclass so um i just cannot say enough about them i mean you look amazing like the leather yeah. wearing like this leather jacket like you i had look- a whole like they hired a publicist and i mean that's a publicist i'm sorry they hired a stylist and the stylist was so wonderful and she Picked, she pulled a bunch of great outfits. She came here to do a fitting. She had everything tailored, bagged up with instructions and sent me with it to Iceland. And so, you know, I was prepared and I got to keep the clothes. Oh my God. I yes. mean, you were giving looks. I love how they have like the paper hanging from the ceiling. Yeah, they built a beautiful, beautiful set and it was a surprise and they, which they try to like sort of unveil each set to writers when they show up for filming. And pink is my favorite color. Like they just genuinely know who their talent is, what they like, what they're about, and they shape everything around that. And it was just awesome. I love that. I, have you ever taken a master class? Yeah, yes. Um, when it first started, I took the Shonda Rhimes class. I've taken the Aaron Sorkin, uh, yeah, the Aaron Sorkin class on writing for television. Which TV writing class was better, Shonda Rhimes or Aaron Sorkin? You know, you can't compare them. They're two different, very different writers. So what, Shonda Rhimes, I got more out of her class in terms of thinking about plot mm-hmm. and tension and you know, what happens in an episode. And with Sorkin, Mm -hmm. I got a lot about dialogue and what you put in your character's mouths. That makes total sense. (laughs) That makes Mm -hmm. complete sense. Going down this road, you know, there are these master classes out there. You know, people who write television shows aren't just plucked from thin air. Like, these are experienced writers. Mm -hmm. How does something like and just like that go so far off the rails? from um, what I'm assuming was the original intention? Uh, Well, you know, it kind of goes off the rails, but it's also the most watched show that has ever streamed on HBO. So 
clearly there's something about the way it went off the rails that has worked for audiences. And I can say that my wife and I watched every episode and we'll watch the next season too. But it was bonkers. The whole show was bonkers. Like what they did to Che and and, and Sada, Ramirez, Sada Ramirez is an incredible actor. They are so smart. They are so committed to progress and change and fighting for a better world. And they're also just a talented actor. They're an incredible singer. And to see like to see them not given a meaty role like in one episode, they tell Miranda that they aren't really into commitment. And in the next episode, they're like, I'm in love with you. Like how? OK, that's a perfect example. How does wild. Tele- how does television writing become so inconsistent? The Elber Generation Q oh, and the original Elber have the same are plagued with the same problem where yeah. something like Queer as Folk in both the original and the revival. Like there are shows that somehow manage to have a consistent logical timeline and consistent character development. How is it that there are some shows, other shows like, and just like that, the L word where it's just like a merry go round of confusion and haphazard decisions, episode to episode. I don't know. I, it depends a lot on the showrunner and it also depends on the kinds of input you get from the studio. You know, a lot of really good shows get really messed up by the time they go to the studio and get you get notes like you get notes from every person so you write your episode like I just finished uh, I'm working on two TV shows and I just finished two pilots Um, and so first I get my producers notes then I get the studios notes then I get the networks notes and like by the time you apply all of those notes like what you originally wrote is very different from what you end up with and you see a lot of that in what happens and I wish more people understood the process of making television to understand how many cooks are in that kitchen. And sometimes that happens. Other times people are just bad at continuity. Um, Other times people are just sort of like going for the melodrama and thinking, Mm -hmm. yeah, well, people aren't going to really care because this is so salacious and so juicy that they're going to just go with it. And turns out they do. Like, what would you do if you were in the writer's room or if you were show running and just like that? What would you do with the Miranda Che Diaz storyline? Or how would you even have written it to begin with? Well, I would have written it such that Miranda leaves Steve before she fucks Che. um, In that Steve cheated on her and she made a huge deal out of it in the second movie. I'm sorry, in the first movie. Mm -hmm. And like raked his ass over the coals for like eight months. As you know, as is her want to do. I get it. I, I wouldn't want to be cheated on. So no problem. But then to completely forget that, like there was no, it was almost like the people in the writer's room never watched the original or the movies. And so Miranda in particular, like was just so far out of character. It made no sense. And yet there were incredible writers that I like and admire in that room. So it wasn't a lack of talent. I honestly don't know what happened there. I truly just cannot figure it out for the life of me. But I would have had more like character consistency with Miranda. And also I would have had Miranda like standing up for herself more instead of just letting Che dictate all of the terms of the relationship. 